welcome to the Embodiment Conference. This is truly an epic event that is raising awareness and revealing just how much is happening in the world of embodiment. And this gives me hope about where we're heading as a people. I'm Amara Pagano. I'm the founder of Azul, a conscious movement path of personal transformation. I work with the body and the power of movement to awaken love and consciousness. Embodiment is a key to my work. And the journey of embodying the map of Azul is what facilitates the process of self-realization. I'm excited to sponsor the Dance and Creativity Channel to share my love of movement and to celebrate the power that it has to serve our collective evolution. If you are interested in awakening your deepest potential or curious about the spiritual and healing aspects of embodiment, I encourage you to check out Azul. Everyone is welcome. I work with people who love movement and people who have never moved. Follow the link and you'll find three gifts for you. A 50-minute Azul journey, a special discount on our online embodiment training, and a free month in our upcoming membership program. So come, check out the Path of Azul. I'll be presenting on the main stage here and in the Dance and Creativity channel, and I hope to see you there. For now, enjoy the richness of the presentation you're about to see. So, hello everybody, welcome. Um, yeah, we're pre-recording this session because otherwise it would be a little bit early in the morning for me here in Europe, 3 a.m. But, um, and I'd like, uh, like to show you this beautiful tree we have behind us here. This is um, um, an apricot tree and it's just losing its leaves right now. So, um, yeah, let's get into, let's get into this, this topic. So, I've asked you all to bring a piece of fruit with you. And um, we're not going to use it just right now, but uh, if you have your piece of fruit with you, perhaps uh, just start to notice um, how this piece of fruit actually is. You know, I've, I've chosen um, um, a quince apple here, and they're really quite knobbly, and um, and it's very shiny. It's, uh, and it smells very nice, but they're really hard. I wouldn't try and bite into this one here. So the first step this is what this talk is about living a more playful life so the first step is uh is about observing and really interacting with what is around us now now this this is nothing new let, let's say but at the same time it is always new because we continually our mind is continuously filtering saying yeah i know what that is yeah i know what that is and it's really hard to connect re really with what actually is going on and this isn't a quince apple this is I mean, it is a quince apple, but that's just a name, right? So it has a different, uh, so that we could do this with everything, right? So this is the, this is why I would say the first step in living a more playful life is really to see the things around us and then, um, uh, and uh, yeah, and, uh, and appreciate what they are and, uh, and, and not necessarily what they can do. And like um, Sir, Sir Ken Robinson, who recently passed away, unfortunately, but he left a whole huge um, array of information, videos, and books. Um, Ken Robinson, he um, he suggested that he uses this example with as a paper clip, right? This is for creativity, and he says if you ask small children how many uses there are for a paper clip, they'll come up with like two hundred, you know. And the the like more lateral thinking kids will say, well, what if it's as tall as a house, or if it's made of uh, metal no it's not really made of metal it's made of wood or and so it doesn't become it's no longer something that just keeps pieces of paper together right? and as children get older and older um we ask them uh, if we ask them how many uses are for a paper clip we'll get down to one answer which is obvious no put them together if you challenge that in any way they'll say no rubbish it's just for holding a paper clip together so this is very quite pertinent with our with our times now and um, so Ken Robinson, he suggests that this is because in schools um, we are taught that there is only one answer, um, which means that everything else is wrong, basically. But, you know, this gets us out of like Im imaginative thinking and, um, and into a process, you know, because if we don't even start on a process, then we won't find and discover anything new or 
you know, life becomes a bit segmented, you know, this is this, and you feel like you know everything already, you know, how boring, what a boring life when we feel like we know everything already, yeah, so this is like a tiny little uh, um, starter from this thing, and um, obviously we're, we're, we're in the embodiment conference, we're, we're talking more, we can all understand this more, it's, it's really when we observe something, um, whether it's an apple or even there with things that move, right? we participate more with them. We, we, we feel with them. Right? So you could say, who are the playfulness masters? Yeah, they're, we could say that they're children right? and small cats. So how can they teach us playfulness? They are the masters, right? So they teach us playfulness through just our connecting, connecting, to what they're doing to, for their energy and that already moves us in this in this delightful way that's not so linear anymore okay so i like this way of thinking not like it's good or bad it's like does this bring me into a more playful attitude or does this bring me into a, into the more of the serious attitude right? um there's a time for being serious obviously but we're we're overloaded with with serious uh, and um, Benny Fabish, uh, when we had a conversation once, he mentioned the, the idea of the mountain of seriousness. I think this really brings the the point. Yeah, this this mountain, which which is like so so enormous, and it really is enormous. And um, so I'm I'm going on a, on a bit of a meander here, but uh, this is is all in line with uh, with uh, with the topic now of playfulness. So. What happened to me personally is that um, I've been I've been juggling for a long time. I've been practicing yoga and tai chi and all this. You know, I I had these moments where I was feeling really serious, you know, and like painfully serious. And um, and I started asking myself, is, is it me? And uh, in part, it is me. But then I started to realise that it really is. Um, it's the rest of the world which is being. Um, mirrored back to me, you know, if everything else around me is serious, it's really hard as an individual to break out of this, right? So this is why I created this festival as well, to create more playful um, ripples, playful ripples in the world. You know? So this comes back to me more and more. So, um, so, so yeah, so, um, so basically we're, the first steps to get you living a more playful life is just to really open up and see things moving. And it can also be the leaves in this apricot tree that are moving. They all have their little dance, you know, and they're, and they're all doing this thing just because that's what they do, you know, in, in this moment. So it's a lot a lot about accepting and, and diving into the thing. And um, anyway, I have a, an important question now before we start doing the juggling. And it is this. So what game uh, do you play in your life? What is what is the game of your life? No, and this is um, what game are you playing? Let, let's say, yeah. So let's take it a slightly easier tangent, right? Let's take it. I, 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 I've been a juggler. I've been juggling for many years now. So for jugglers, the, their favourite game, let's say, is uh, and this is we can take a parallel to this thing. The jugglers, their, their favourite game is the ever more difficult. This is what hypes them up you know it hypes us up as jugglers but it's only one of the games you know um, what we'll do in a little while as well is we'll play with our piece of fruit and we'll see that it doesn't necessarily have to be more difficult though the challenge brings us into this into the zone you know? the zone playfulness they're all very much connected with these, uh, these states right and um so uh so yes yeah, so what game are we, are we playing in our lives and um, often, you know, it's like, what role are we playing inside this game that's our life? And just if we could just stop a second and see the film that's going by and just, uh, this is from a playful point of view, just do something different. Just be silly, you know, just do something that's un like completely out of, uh, um, one thing could be, one thing I, I like to do, which uh, which I would encourage you all to do this this thing is, let's let's say your wife or your husband or your boss or something he starts criticising you, right? So what's a really cool thing to do with this criticising energy? 
just shake it. <laughs> just shake it. And, uh, you, you know, the other person will go to you like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, and you're going, well, you know, this criticism, I, I appreciate what you're saying to me, but the energy is coming a bit hard, you know? And, uh, and then perhaps you start up a whole other, other topic about this, and perhaps the other person starts laughing, or perhaps you get fired, I don't know. But that might be a blessing anyway. But uh, just to shake, just to loosen, loosen up, you know, when we have feel this stiffness in us, we just loosen a little bit, and already we feel better, no? And like, you know, we have this, um, in, play, in, in living a more playful life, what is, what, we say no far too often, and I'm not talking about boundaries here, I'm talking about our reaction, no, you know, closing down. But yes, you know, it's all this opening with arms already, you know, this is, this is embracing, embracing life, yeah, this is, yes. And like this, a bit sneakier if we like. Yes. Yeah, and it already feels more uplifting, whatever we're doing. Hmm? So the opposite of playfulness isn't work. You no, know, the opposite of play isn't work. Um, this is one of the, the fields you know, of, of playfulness. It's finding the, the link between them. You know? um, the opposite of playfulness, different people have said this, the opposite of play is depression, you know? And if we think of play, playfulness as being more of an open, light expression, depression is definitely more of a darker uh, nature. But, you know, if we start to move in our bodies, we can uh, we can change the way our, our beings are quite quickly, you know? And um, start playing with other people. And um, it's uh, what I like to do. I'll share what I like to do is um, when I go into a supermarket, uh, I'll try and play a little bit with the cashiers, you know? Like, oh, hey, oh, you know? Just uh, like a little bit theatrical somehow, a little bit more playful. And they love it, these people, you know? It's like uh, you put a little smile on their face, perhaps. And um, you see, and, and when we're training, you know, because they're in their role. It's not just like some stranger on the street. And um, so we're looking for occasions to, to train our playfulness a little bit, you know? And you, people often, you know, in supermarkets, they have their names written on the thing there. And you say, hey, thanks, uh, Jill, <laughs> or or Peter, or whoever it is, you know. And uh, they're like, oh, uh, okay. You know? And it's this bringing this lightness, um, which is which is this essence of playfulness that I'm, that I'm, that I'm interested in. So go, going back again, you see I'm zapping a bit all over the place. I hope you're managing to follow me. This is a bit how my brain works a little bit, I think. So the, the game that most people like to play, um, no, it's not football, it's not tennis. <laughs> it's uh, the game of who's right. And this is like, it's so such a nasty game that we play, the game of who's right. And um, my, my, let's say, uh, my suggestion is that um, if we want more playfulness into our lives, just monitor, monitor this thing about the game, the, the, this game that wants to be, who wants to be right, you know? And we start getting into this, like, two dogs fighting over a bone this kind of situation. Just drop it. Just drop it. And uh, do something, shake, or do something completely out of the ordinary, or, or say, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, just let it go. And, um, you know, this is, sometimes we get caught up in this, in this, this, this game of being right, and uh, it really takes a lot of energy out of this, this thing, you know? So, anyway, let's uh, move on a second. I'll have a quick sneaky look at my notes here. So, yeah. Oh, perhaps, perhaps um... Oh, yeah, let's just say this bit here, and then uh, we'll go on to, to one more juggling stuff. So, We've, uh, together, we thought that the smallest unit of playfulness is, uh, oh, there's lots of different things, and perhaps we can come up with more if we think of them, is, uh, is a smile between two strangers, right? Just a tiny little smile, um, and it's, it's this putting yourself out there that um, makes, vibrates, you know, sometimes it's a bit too much, or it's just like, you smile at someone and it's like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> You're terrified, you know, or uh, and we need to train this because it's um, it somehow gives us such a kick of life. Um, but we can train this. Bernie Bernie de Coven, he was a great uh, playfulness 
a guru, let's say like this, and um, he would suggest that, um, well, apart from smiling at ourselves in the mirror, which is always a really good one, you know, smiling at ourselves in the mirror, seeing ourselves smiling, smiling, you know, this, this gazing in the mirror thing could be very powerful, you know, even just a few moments, um, accepting ourselves, I love you, Anthony, you know, and, uh, and um, yeah, you're a playful guy, you know, <laughs> and, and smiling to ourselves, and, uh, and um, so yeah, this is Bernie de Coven, he suggests this, and, and this is another, this is a great thing, eh? People walking out their dogs, they're saying, you know, you've got a cute little dog, and um, you see the dog, and you smile at the dog, and you transfer the smile that's for the dog, up to the, the, to, the, to the owner, and you'll very often get a smile this way, you know, and uh, also little babies in their prams, oh, you smile at the baby and you smile at the mum, you know, there's this sweet innocence there that, that uh, helps us to, to train this playfulness and also spread this lightness and this, this play, playful energy, playful energy around. And, um, but it's a tricky one, eh? Sometimes people won't smile back to you. Sometimes people won't, um, yeah, they will perhaps just give you a poker face, total poker face. And again, Bernie de Coven, he um, playfully keeps like a score. He'll say like a one for playfulness. Ah, oh, yeah, smile back to me. And then there'll be like, a, oh, this is um, one uh, against uh, playfulness. Humanity, actually, he says. So he keeps score a little bit, you know, doesn't like actually keep score, but like as a playful to, to make this playfulness because it hurts. You know, if you go and smile to someone and they give you a frown or something, it's like a dagger, the dagger in your heart, eh? So, uh, and, um, okay, so another thing is to do something rather unexpectedly every now and again, like, for example, jump, climb off a tree. And then from up the tree, you say, hello! <laughs> and uh, tree climbing is great. And that guy would stay up here for a lot longer, but, um, I just wanted to take this moment of comic relief up a tree. So, um, yeah, we have a little break in a second, I think. Uh, and, should, we uh, have a, um, should we just have a little quick smi uh, smile at each other game? Yeah. I'm going to bring myself in if I can figure out how to do that. Maybe I can, maybe I can't. But, whoa, can I not spotlight myself? I don't think I can. I was just doing it in the last one. However, maybe we can do it back and forth with a smile. And we can practice different ways <laughs> of responding to the smile, good and bad. So you want to smile at me and pass sure. it when you're ready? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and it's really hard to not feel fake, you know? So. I don't know. It feels fun and funny to me, so I'm like... <laughs> But I could also just be pissed and respond like, oh, who's that person smiling at me? Yeah, yeah, you know, you have to you have to be delicate, you know, and try out with people, try out with um, with small children as well, you know, just smiling at them and, and smiling at people that are already smiling as well, you know. Even already, already when we see someone who's smiling, we, we smile at them, it's already um, quite a strong gesture, quite a strong gesture to make. Thank you. Just wanted to throw myself into your into your presentation for a minute. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm really happy, and you know, I've been I've been rambling on like because one of the things that happened to me, uh, Laura, is that all of a sudden I started to, to see that jugglers aren't exactly the most playful people out there, you know. And I was thinking like, how is this possible, you know? How is this possible? And um, then I started to really realise that, that it's an attitude, you know. I don't know if I said this earlier, I can't remember now, but all the embodiment work we do, this is marvellous to live a more playful life because it makes emotions and sensations flow through us. We're much more connected to ourselves. But it, if it stops there, even embodiment practitioners can be deadly serious, you know, and take themselves too seriously. And um, this, this is part of my work. This will be part of my work now to help people, you know, that... Uh, that realize this, not everybody realizes this, eh? they don't realize that um, that they have this thing. And, and, and you know, it's 
when we start to get more into a plate or have more enthusiasm, we can we can transmit things much better to other people. We can really transmit transmit content and and the ideas and thoughts they go further. And it's um it's not just like about reading a list of things, you know, they're coming out. So um let's let's do this thing with uh one with one uh, piece of fruit now. Now I suggested to a piece of fruit. Because everybody, well, most people have a fruit, but you could also have a ball if you like. Okay, so let, let's stand up a second. So I have a bit more space here. And uh, well, first of all, just let's, let's just throw it from side to side. And catching, we're catching, throwing it with the whole bodies because this is what we're doing. You know, in uh, this makes it more, much more an embodied practice when um, I, I'm, I'm absorbing and I'm throwing, I'm absorbing and I'm throwing. And then let's just make it a little bit wider. Yeah, great. <laughs> and then a bit wider. And then we can also catch it a little bit later. So we're not catching it here anymore, but like always on the floor. Down. Zup. Down. And this already makes it much more connected to the body. Okay, and there's something inherently playful about throwing and catching. And there's also something, it's about uh, like primitive communication also with throwing and catching with other people, especially children. They like it when we throw a ball to them, they throw it back to us. You know, adults generally as well. It's a great way to break the ice to have a, an object. You throw, you throw it with someone's name and they throw it back to you. Knowing people's names is also a good one for the playful part, right? So let's do this movement now under your leg so under the leg it makes it instantly funny when i drop the ball <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is the thing you know we get over our fear of failure with uh, with learning to juggle because it happens you know it falls down you pick it up and we don't care so you know there's, there's some powerful lessons with learning learning to juggle and also this is another thing about being on a playful path learning new things all the time learning new things and um so right okay so under the arm now so really this emphasis on catching it and softening the whole body okay cool so let's just do this um under the leg under the arm under the leg, under the arm, under the leg, under the arm, under the leg, under the arm, under the leg, under the arm. And if it's dropped, pick it up again. And I'll do the other side now, under the other leg, under the other arm, under the other leg, under the other arm. So let me ask a question. Just yes, about, sure. I know this is not supposed to be technical, but when you're, just to come back, and I want to do it some more, but when, sure, you're sure, sure, sure. It, yeah. when you're throwing under the leg, you, you, you lift your leg and then the throw or under the arm, like the throw happens after your arm has gone under the arm. Yeah. The, okay. This is, um, this is a very, um, this is a high level brain thing in the sense that we have to anticipate the movement with a leg to throw under. So we're having to measure this time. So, as I catch the ball, as I bring the arm down, I'm already lifting up the leg. So, it, because if I lift my leg up at the last moment, it, I've not got enough time. That's perfect, yeah. yeah. And um, we can also do the same thing on our, behind our backs. This is a bit more difficult, so. If it's not working, it, it might well not work straight away, but something oh. or later. <laughs> I can't even go back one. I'm just making a big oh. <laughs> Yeah, there's lots of things we can do. And we can also play with bouncing on the body, shoulder, knee, elbow, head. <laughs> So 
So anyway, juggling for me is my um, playful practice. And um, I think it's important to have some sort of thing that we come back to and are passionate about and that we want to learn more things every day that has no real um, aim other than the pleasure of doing it in itself. Okay? So we're all very much goal orientated. And even if it's not for work, we do things because they're good for us, you know? And um, we don't do so many things just because it feels good. So this is um, also a big shift, doing things that feel good. And this doesn't mean don't do things that don't feel good. It's, uh, it means perhaps there's another way of doing this that I can, that can increase my interest in what I'm doing. You know? And um, there's a brilliant talk by Alan Watts, Work as Play. And that's on, on YouTube as well, and I recommend watching that. And he uses this example of a bus driver. And he says, if a bus driver doesn't treat his work as if it was a game, as if it wasn't playing, it would be a terrible chore. And I think for some bus drivers, it probably is a terrible chore. But, you know, it's like you're playing a video game. You know, you imagine, imagine this bus driver, you know, stops and starts to get some people on. And, uh, and uh, there's this feeling that we're, that we're actually playing a game when we do things. And when we hook into this energy, then, thing, then anything we do is, is just made lighter somehow. So doing things more playfully doesn't necessarily mean I have to be rolling around and laughing all the time. It's just this interest that I'm into it, you know. It's, it's like it grasps my attention and I enjoy doing it. And it um, makes a whole, a whole huge difference, eh? a huge difference. So let me see my... Uh, so um, Yeah, I love Alan Watts. He's got yeah. some great thoughts. Yeah. So playfulness is actually also the cure, let's say, for perfectionism. You know? And a lot of, I say this like um, um, with my tongue in my cheek, the cure for perfectionism. It's taking the, the best out of perfectionism. Because what, what the difference is I, I try and do something with my best intention uh, and just let it go then. You know, it's like it either works really well or, you know, it's it's like what's in, in the Gita, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, being just detached from the fruits of our actions somehow, you know, putting our all into whatever it is, and then um, perfectionism becomes a problem when we um, decide what outcome we want. I think this is this is how I see it right now, anyway. Um, being a perfectionist. It, wanting to do your best is, is is human nature i think you know really wanting to do do our best and um we all we also want to be uh acknowledged for this as well but uh when we get really more playful i think we can let this go as well the acknowledgement thing you know because we're not doing we realize we're not doing it for the acknowledgement okay okay so i have a couple of other things i'd like to share with uh with you guys if you have anything you, you, you want to interrupt me with something, uh, then uh, please, please say so, um, Laura. So there's one thing about, um, just say something about parents, right? Parents. And, uh, and um, if it's small children, parents generally are pretty boring. You know, it's like not boring because they're boring, boring because how they use their bodies is boring. You know, they're either standing or they're sitting. Um, some children are lucky that their parents actually spend time on the floor with them. You know, and there are, there are associations and, that recommend that, that we use more <coughs> more time, more floor time with our children. And they say it's really important. And as a parent, this floor time will also help you understand what they want to do. And, uh, and, um, <coughs> and, um, there's this shift you know, in, in a playful mi mindset where we want the children to, to be our masters. You know, we want them to teach us and to let us know what they want. You know? And it, it's um, when I was a child, I mean, my parents, they had this, this idea, like many parents, you know, that they have to teach me something. You know? and, and this is cool, you know, and I respect it, but it's actually the other way around. The other way around is much more beneficial for everybody. You know? um, Especially when we see it in this lens of a, of a, of a more whole wholesome self, you know? and um, one thing I, I I did a lot of kids yoga classes 
and uh, in a really fun way. Um, and um, with uh, with Gopala, he he was my mentor from Ra Rainbow Rainbow Yoga, Rainbow Kids Yoga. And anyway, um, and uh, one thing I tried out with sometimes was when I did these parents and children classes, the parent I just suggested to the parents they just just copy, imitate their children, without them without even really letting them know. So the fact that sit, but copy of them, copy of them not just physically but emotionally and uh, and energetically. So and this always <coughs> was was a great experience and people love it. You know they really love it. And after a while the children they also understand what's going on and they. Uh, they, they they start playing together. So th this is really what what we what we mean by having the children as, be, as teaching you and being masters is 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 through their being, not through like necessarily what they're doing, what they want, no, but just connecting to them. Would you like to show us a little bit or lead us through one of your children's get onto the floor embodiment yoga classes? Oh, let's just do a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. Okay, so. Uh, Make sure you can see yourself. Can you see me here, Laura? Yeah? Okay, so this is straight out of Rainbow Kids, eh? And this is, I love this stuff, eh? So one thing is feet to feet, like this. <laughs> so we have, um, we have a um, fly like a butterfly. So fly like a butterfly, fly like a butterfly, fly like a butterfly in the sky. Fly like a butterfly, fly like a butterfly, fly like a butterfly in the sky. You go, yeah, yeah. copy feet, yeah. you know. And your slightly older children, they look at you, they they. They're not into it, you know, they're like, hmm, what's going on there? And you can play with this as well, you know, like, I oh, yeah, don't worry, this is just like, uh, um, you can sort of be cool with them as well. If they're, and the little kids, they love it, you know, they love this stuff. So then we have um, the butterfly, and then we have the flower. And then we have the butterfly, and the flower, and the flower, and the butterfly, and the butterfly, and the flower, and the flower, and the butterfly, and the butterfly, and the flower, and the flower, and the butterfly, and the butterfly, and the flower, and the butterfly. And the butterfly, and the butterfly. <laughs> It's just a little bit, you put the energy in their nose, it's a little bit crazy. And then you go, ah, oh, the butterfly is exhausted. Um, what does the butterfly want now? He wants to drink some nectar. <laughs> goes down and drinks his nectar. Brilliant. And then you say like um then he gets out his really big wings. There you go. Ah, so it's good, eh? Do a little stretch. <laughs> gets out his really big wings. And he's got his really big wings. And his really big wings. And they're both big wings together. Whoppa. So in the in the quarantine period, I did a lot of uh live sessions for, for children and their families. You know, I didn't know what was going on, really, what happened in their houses. Um, I got some positive feedback, and it felt good somehow as well to do this, uh, to sharing, sharing with them in their homes. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. My <laughs> Great to have a little stretch. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's good to have a little stretch every now and again, you know. Ah, uh, ah, uh, chop a rib cage in. Uh. And I've also been, since all this pandemic has started, I've been doing a lot of chair yoga sessions, you know. And um, the idea was just to do one. And then I saw that it, it took on so well with like parents and my friends, and, and my friends enjoyed it as well. That, that I keep doing it. I keep doing these live chair yoga sessions. They're a bit fun. Their the spirit is light. You know, it's not. I mean, it is playful. I mean, um, but you can do a lot. You no, know, in your chair, you can do a hell of a lot in your chair. You can spin around, especially if we're in the front of the computer all day watching things. You know, we can do all sorts of funny things. You know? 
And the important thing you know is to get keep this thing here loose, the chest loose. Chest loose. Ah. Ah. Yeah, spin our arms around. <laughs> Let's do some funny things with our elbows. Okay, so see the elbow pointing up here. Yeah, cool. And the fists, they stay still. Yeah, brilliant, Laura. <laughs> yeah, I've never done that one. That's a great one. Yeah, yeah, no, you've got that rolling, eh? And if anyone had any troubles, you can hold on to your thumb, makes it easier. Yeah. yeah. All that computer arm release. Okay, let's just do another couple of, of uh, coordination games. One is finger and thumb. Finger, thumb. So this is easy right now, okay? But when we do it with the other side on the opposite level, it becomes difficult. So together. So, so. <laughs> Yeah, you're getting it though, you're getting it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's so funny. Oh, okay, anyway, try this on your own. These sort of things, they, they move something in, in our brains, they open up. Um, I like this one, it's like a, well, it, it, it's, it's a hunter and a rabbit, you know? So, and the hunter never gets the rabbit actually. So the rabbit runs away. And then the rabbit runs away. And it's not the gun doesn't go up and down, it's the rabbit. <laughs> okay, so here the rabbit goes up and down, not the gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh. So it's all this patting your head and uh stroking your stomach thing, which is uh which is um so let, let's just take like 30 seconds just to feel our bodies feel how feel how this is uh what is changing in us now are we softening are we feeling lighter are we feeling confused i hope not are we feeling inspired are we feeling calmer are we feeling more excited Can you talk about that edge? I'm sorry, I totally interrupted you. But oh. the edge of like, so what, what I'm noticing is I do this rabbit and gun, like parts of my head, you know, I have to think about what's actually going on. And, and I noticed that also, like if I, I also learned to play violin and when I'm having that concentration moment, like it's like, sometimes I just burn out and I'm like, oh, I can't do it anymore. I have to stop and, and, and reset and come back. Does that happen to you with, with these exercises or with juggling or do you experience that when you see other people in your classes? Um, there's, um, okay, let's just, just do a little, little experiment a second, okay? So the experiment is this. There are fingers here and they go up and they touch together up here, okay? And they go down and they touch again here. So let's do it with the eyes, imagining that the fingers are very uh, like, they have like, little light bulbs on the end, so eyes closed. Um, yeah, do it again. <laughs> I totally missed it on top. Yeah, and, and uh, there's an, also another very interesting game. I'll just show it a second. Well, we can also try it, eh? but it takes, it takes a while. Like we have our apple again. Fruit. We place it there. I don't know if you can see it. And I walk uh, some distance away. I see where it is. I don't count my steps. I see where it is. I close my eyes and I go to grab, grab it. Ah, and I was like about five centimeters away. Okay. And um, this sort of thing and all sorts of work with, with the eyes closed um, is helping our. Um, let's say the inner faculty of our of our vision oh yeah that was great so we're also, so for these exercises as well yeah sometimes you just have to concentrate on it you know but it's like what what happens with, in the process of juggling right i mean i think juggling has something very special about it 
and um, for ver various reasons. And um, I've been juggling so long, so long now. I think I can share some things with, with you about this. Um, one thing about juggling, learning to juggle three balls, let's say, already. Because I think playing with one ball is actually enough already. You know, put on some music, and there's lots of things you could do with this. And um, but actually, learning three balls for a lot of people. For most people, I would say, is like, no, I couldn't possibly do this. Yeah. So when I personally learned, learned to juggle three balls, it was really, you know, what they call um, an epiphany, epiphany moment. But I think it was more than that, you know. It was really like, whoa, I could do this. And then the next thought was like, all those things that they told me in school that I was no good and no, not coordinated at all, and I had no talent for these things, it was like rubbish. And then the next thought was like, well, then I can do anything. <laughs> no, there was all these thoughts that just went. You know, the positive thoughts and this, like all this conditioning and these things that made, people made me feel this dropped away totally, you know. So for this, I find that learning to juggle has a huge, a huge value because it really gives you self-confidence if you can do it, you know. If your teacher is coming from that space of encouragement and wanting you, because otherwise you could be disturbed for life. You know, oh, you can't do it, you're no good. You can, you can reinforce your feeling of insecurity and, and not being coordinated, you know? So, um, so, uh, so, right, okay, so juggling. Basically, um, after I've thrown a ball, I have to forget it for a little while. This is the thing, okay? Like if I already can do this step here, to be able to throw this one and not pass it like this, let's say, I have to forget, I have to, you know, I have to like let go of it a second to be totally here in this hand to be able to throw from here. So I'm here and then I'm here. Otherwise, I'm still with this one and I'm very partially with this other hand and then it, it's, it's not working then, you know. So this is when we say letting go, juggling is like letting go. This is this what it means, you know. It's like... Every one I throw, I, I let go of it, I let go of it, I let go of it. So then, you know, it's, uh, otherwise, you know, if we've done a lot with two balls, this sort of thing, this habit, we bring it into the new pattern because this would be three balls like this, right? Which is, uh, it's, it's, it's possible. It's a lot faster though than this pattern. But we have this, 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 body habit to part to get out of let's say okay so the way to get out of this is to be aware so i'm aware that i'm doing this and then i understand that i have to be aware of the moment just before i do it up and i throw up in the air again see so i'm like oh, ah. you know and i then i bust through the habit and um and then it's rolling it's rolling again for me you know this is the thing so it's the same thing with this what you were what you were asking with this is that um when i know that this hand is doing it right this hand just does this thing so i concentrate more on this one and then i swap here and then i just concentrate on this one here and I concentrate on this one here and then it's like where am i focusing you know this is the this is the thing i'm focusing on this on the detail but at the same time on the whole thing and swapping around and um yeah, I find that exact same thing in playing music, where you have to be able to pl let go of one thing so that you can do another thing, like to sing and play guitar at the same time or, or whatever. But with this, it's the same, it's the same brain moment of, okay, so your explanation was really helpful, that shifting and, oh, here it is, here's my attention. So it's yeah. really mastering your attention and your awareness in your body. Yeah, no, that's it, that's it, that's absolutely it. That's absolutely it, certainly. And um, when I was, uh, yeah, 22, when I first arrived in Italy, I was doing all sorts of dance lessons and I did a lot of um, more like modern jazz and stuff like this, you know, and they were really difficult for me, these lessons, you know. I hadn't got this this ability to be able to read bodies and transpose it into my own, you know. Now, I'm 45 now, and... Um, I'm starting to feel, we, we, I mean, Tai Chi is very simple, eh? I mean, it's very slow is what I mean, I don't mean it's simple. But now I feel that I'm I'm able to understand more and, and, and bring movement more into my body now. So it's a long process, you know, and 
dances at that level it's really hard you know yeah you, ha you have to start doing this stuff when you're a kid i reckon it's just because it's you don't have this visual this visual ability in your body you know it's like missing somehow you know and um so yeah then i started doing a lot more contact improvisation and i found it a lot uh, more accessible <laughs> yeah. well your body gets to learn the patterns right without having to be forced into them and then maybe it's easier to learn the patterns that are like I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this balance between freedom and form in your juggling you have a real form right but you yeah. then have to let go and be able to be free with it yeah yeah actually i'm much more interested now in um in juggling without a form you know like just playing around just So there's uh there's this uh one thing that's really cool about juggling is that there isn't really like um a method behind it other than learning three balls like this there isn't really a method to bring it into an art which is on one side it's a really cool thing because it means that um uh, it's very free and open but on the other side of things um it means that there are a lot of self-taught jugglers that uh, don't really get into the art side of things. You know? So this has been a, a lot of my work in the last 20 years is working with jugglers, actually, about um, really, it, essentially, it's, I'm, I'm understanding this now, it's really what I've been doing is doing embodiment work with jugglers to get their body to, to have the juggling as an expression of, uh, of what, what they want to say, you know, what, what uh, mood they want to transmit. So juggling otherwise is a bit stiff, you know, it's a bit like this. And otherwise it could be a lot m more beautiful and weird. And uh... Yeah, I felt that right away in the beginning because I was just throwing the ball back and forth. And then you're like, but land, let it come into your body. And then you said, don't grab it right away. Wait till the end. You know, like all these different possibilities really change our our perception and our awareness of how it's happening sure sure <laughs> and seeing and you juggle with all those things in different in different possibilities has just been is really you see it yeah we can start to change the plane as well you know we can start to go right from here to there and um yeah and do this all sorts of things you know it move, you have have the access to this sort of plane as well which is uh which is very cool <laughs> Anyway, let me see. Let my let me have a, my little look at my list a second, because I've written a couple of things here that are the, like the. Yes, this thing here is very interesting. The risk benefit analysis. Um, so my friend uh, Peter um, Peter Duncan um, from um, Circus Eruption in in uh, in the UK. He, uh, he's talked to me a lot about this thing about risk benefit analysis and basically we do a lot of um, risk analysis nowadays right do like let's say climbing a, let's use the uh, climbing a tree and also um, playing in a stream okay play climbing a tree mm, there's risks you know a, a, a branch could snap you could fall down um, you could get stung by some bees uh, I don't know you could, there's all sorts of risks climbing a tree right but then if we put it on the plane of the, the benefits of the of the risk um then we have like uh, empowerment you no know, self-confidence um coordination uh being grounded in the body uh, and then we start to see that the balance between the three and perhaps the risk the benefits of the risk are greater than the 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 um than the dangers let's say you know and the same thing playing in a stream you will have people nearby um not talking about being like outright outrightly dangerous but not not stopping everything you know this control mindset that we're also seeing now you know it's coming out more and more it's peaking now you know this crap control mindset and um then we stop living you know so this is where playfulness comes you know we can't I mean, you don't want to be outright, like, outrightly 
I mean, extreme sports, you know, that's a whole other thing, you know. I don't think we need to be so extreme to access our playfulness, you know. We don't need to be quite so extreme. And um, so this is a very interesting thing, and I think we need to talk a bit more about this risk, uh, the benefits of risks. And, um, and there's this thing, uh, in Italy anyway, they say, say a lot more about watch out, you know, stay attento. <laughs> No, but we see in England, in England, and I'm sure in the US as well, parents, they say to their children, watch out, watch out. You know, um, and what happens when someone says to you, watch out? What, what happens to your body? You freeze, you know, and you don't know where the danger is coming from. You're like, whoa. <laughs> so watch out is really a terrible thing. You know, it's much better to say, um, do you feel secure up there? You know, do you feel, do you feel good? Are you feeling balanced? Um, what's your next, what are your next moves going to be? Um, what have you got, what are you thinking about? <laughs> you know, and, um, yeah, how do you feel? And, and this sort of thing invites more into, uh, into a child deciding for themselves, you know, if something feels good for them or not. And, um, this is a really important point that I would like to, like to say, yeah, what, watch out about saying watch out <laughs> watch out you watch out you know it's like this watch out you watch out and um because they just pop out of us eh? they pop out of us because we're afraid and um there's this great book no um uh, feel your fear and do it anyway you know it's a really a really really cool book this book and uh well she suggests and i think this is quite brutal eh? That in the end, as a parent, as anybody, our biggest fear is that we're not going to be able to cope with it. So we're actually not really afraid that a child will hurt themselves. We're more afraid that we will feel guilty and, and not feel good with ourselves. So this is a bit hard, eh? This is like, whoa. <laughs> but I think it's good to say these things as well, you know, to realise them. You know, realise what is my fear behind this thing, you know? Um... I'm going to get into, uh, into a pickle, yeah, I suppose. But yeah, but anyway, uh, th this is it, you know, it's like, definitely we're f afraid, we're afraid to be more playful. So, and, and, and I think it's cool to be playful. I mean, obviously I do, this is what I'm talking about, <laughs> it's, my, it's my thing, you know. But like, um, I started to really see, and I suppose everybody sees this in their own field, right? It's, but it, it's like, it could be such a help all sorts of situations just being a little bit lighter and a little bit more playful and um, giving people a little bit more leeway and a little bit more trust um, you know giving people trust and then you get more trust back and, and especially in big companies you know there's a lot of controlling what people are doing and people don't like it you know they don't like it so they they don't give their best you know in, in more playful companies people feel part of it you know and they're so it's in nobody's interest really to, uh, to have strict control regimes. You don't win people's hearts. Mm. So tell me about this um, festival that you organized. I see, I saw on your, that you, the, what is it, Giocosamente? That's it, that's it. That um, you did it online this year. How yeah. long has it been going? And tell me what you do in that. Okay, well, well we, it actually only started like two years ago. I was doing an online course with uh, Charles Eisenstein about uh, living in the gift. And I was really pon pondering about it. Well, like, what is my gift, you know? And it came down to playfulness. And like, I didn't ne never really saw it as a thing, you know? It was like a modality. But then I was thinking, well, how am I going to develop this thing, you know? And then I thought, well, you know, I live in this little village. And uh, actually, I'll show you my little village. You can, you can see it here. Can you see it up there on the hill? Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, hope I put the camera back properly where it was. So, um, so basically, I was, uh, um, I thought, yeah, let's organise a festival here. So I contacted a load of uh, playfulness people, and I went to a festival counterplay in um, in Denmark, and I was inspired by this whole thing, and um, and I was inspired by this idea of being more playful in work, being more playful in life. I'd be more playful in education, you know, separating a bit like this. I mean, they're all interwoven together. 
So um, the idea was to hold different workshops. People came around and signed up to them. But at the same time, offering something back to the village. So we had all these like hopscotch type things and interactive um, uh, signs, uh, just just self-guided. So people will go through the village and do things. You know, I mean, if even just like hopping on your leg one time or walking backwards or closing your eyes for two steps, if you've never done this stuff, this gets you completely out of your serious mind and then then something some wall drops in your mind and you then you you can connect with everybody else you know and there were lots of there was lots of people like well what are you going to do in this playfulness festival here you know what's going on nobody understood in the, in the village at all but afterwards they loved it you know they said oh what a great atmosphere you know and this is the thing the biggest thing they didn't know what happened really but they just loved the atmosphere and um we closed off the streets so no cars could come by so children were playing in the street with like you know like really simple games with like boards and balls on them and sand and and um yeah and this this was this is what happened there and then this year uh, you know i wasn't my first of all i thought oh let's do it online and then i thought no we can't do it online and then i was thinking well i need a reason to do it online and then it came to me that the reason was um that it, it can raise the quality of our lives playfulness essentially raises the quality of our lives it's not to do with quantity it's not to do with it's to do with how we live our lives you know so yeah uh, well thank you tiny, so much tiny for side, eh? we've got well we're running out of time now but you know dean ornish in his book um reversing heart disease he takes it back the illness of heart disease he takes it back to a point where it's about us being isolated you know so and, and this whole thing a bit about being isolated is what makes brings heart attacks, you know. So playfulness is, is essentially also a cure for heart disease, you know. I mean, to do yes. with, also to do with uh, um, how we eat, obviously as well. Eh? But uh, but um, so anyway, I did it online and it worked really well. It had a great response and uh, and um, it wasn't too big and it was quite intimate and uh, we had some quality discussions and. Uh, I'm still, we, we did it in June and I'm still, I have, we have a pop, podcast, the Playful Life podcast, and I'm, I'm uploading some of the episodes that we did together and the panel sessions I'm uploading onto the podcast. So, uh, What's the best way for people to reach you now? Ha ha ha! Uh, to pop by and say hello. <laughs> no, I, I, well, I would, I would say I'm more active on my, um, on my, uh, on this, this, the podcast, there's some, definitely some really cool stuff on it, on the Playful Life podcast, and um, to pop by actually also on the, on the live chair yoga session, that's on this Playful Life uh, on the Facebook page, and um, great, thank you so much, I just need to end it up, but I'm going to come back to you for your one sentence decision on what the ultimate embodiment tip is so i just want to thank everybody for for participating in this session with anthony trahair which has been wonderful and let you know that we are offering these sessions for free for 48 hours but if you have the means to invest in this embodiment conference it would mean a lot to us and to the rest of the world as we hope for a more embodied world and community where people like to play and get together and breathe together so Thank you so much. And Anthony, what is your last sentence, golden nugget of an embodiment tip? Yeah, it's like when we feel stressed and disconnected, slow down, slow down, slow down, and start to reconnect with your, with your environment. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.